Oh. Hello there. This episode of Biographics is brought to you. Finish my mouth, Bob. <sighs> this episode of Biographics is brought to you by Magic Spoon. If you're a regular viewer of my channel, you know that I love cereal. Unfortunately, doesn't always love your bag, even the most cereals are overprocessed and absolutely slammed with sugar. There were several years where I just never ate any cereal because it's just like, that's more sugar than I need in my life. Well, along comes Magic Spoon and are like, look, fact boy, we've got a cereal that has no sugar, lots of protein, and just three grams of net carbs per serving, and it's only 110 calories. Cool, I think. I don't know much about protein, and carbs, other than the former is good, and the latter probably not so much. But that zero sugar thing had me sold. And it sounds like you'd be like, oh, that's not gonna taste very good, is it? And it actually tastes amazing. It's like it's loaded with sugar, except that it's not. Now, originally they had four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and blueberry, but just recently, much to my delight, they've added some new ones, including peanut butter and cinnamon. And right now, for a limited time, Magic Spoon is bringing back their small batch birthday cake flavor, which you can buy in a special five pack in honor of their birthday. Everyone really loved it last year, so it's sure to be popular again this year. I haven't actually got my package of it yet, but I know it'll be good because it's from Magic Spoon. Use my promo code BIOGRAPHICS and you're at $5 off. Magic Spoon has a 100% happiness guarantee, so if you don't like it, they'll give you your money back. Perfect. And let's get into today's video. The East End of London is not a place that has always benefited from a positive reputation. Quite the opposite, in fact. For centuries, it was regarded as one of the city's poorest and most crime-ridden areas. This image was reinforced by writers such as George Gissing, who referred to it as the City of the Dead, and American author Jack London, who actually lived there for a few weeks and gave a first-hand account of the hellish conditions he witnessed in The People of the Abyss. The area was filled with working-class people, many of them immigrants who were jammed into overcrowded and dilapidated buildings and often resorted to vices such as drinking and prostitution to forget about the pain of their squalid existence. Wherever there weren't tenement buildings, there were glue factories, rendering plants, tanning yards, coal works, soap boilers and slaughterhouses. All the dirty and foul trades were confined to the East End so as not to tarnish the richer, more fashionable West End of London. Consequently, the East End was also rife with crime. The Ratcliffe Highway is located there, a road historically infamous for many seedy businesses, but also where the notorious Ratcliffe murders took place. Whitechapel is also in the East End, the area once prowled by Jack the Ripper. During the mid-20th century, the area became more and more associated with organized crime, and two brothers soon emerged as the undisputed kings of the East End. They were the Cray Twins, and alongside their gang, which they dubbed The Firm, they were responsible for most criminal rackets in the area during the 1950s. But this was just the beginning for Ronnie and Reggie, as they used their influence and money to open nightclubs in the West End. These were popular and fashionable, and all of a sudden the Cray twins were celebrities in their own right, mingling with stars and socialites from both London and across the pond. The Crays became an integral part of the pop culture of the swinging 60s in the UK, just as much as miniskirts, mods, and music. Ronald and Reginald Cray were born on October 24, 1933, in Hoxton, East London, to Charles Sr. and Violet Annie Cray. They were twins, although Reggie was ten minutes older than Ronnie. They also had another brother, Charles James, who was six years older than both of them. Their father was a traveling trader who roamed the country buying and selling various items, particularly clothing and jewelry. His presence in the twins' life was sporadic, not only due to his job, but also because he had to go on the run in 1942 after refusing to be conscripted into World War II. The boys' upbringing was mainly handled by the many women in their lives, their mother, their aunts, and their grandmothers. Ronnie and Reggie left school when they were both 15 years old, looking for employment. They worked various odd jobs, including six months in the Billingsgate fish market, which would end up becoming the longest legitimate job that they would ever have. The twins also started developing a reputation as neighborhood tough guys, always getting into fights and other scrapes. Their maternal grandfather, Jimmy Cannonball Lee, used to be a boxer in his day, so he turned them onto the sport. Both siblings were quite proficient, although Reggie was the standard. In 1948, he became the London schoolboy champion and made it to the finals of the Great Britain schoolboy event. Their other brother, Charlie, recalled that boxing was one of the first things to showcase the different personalities of the twins. Reggie was cool and calculated. He showed skill and willingness to learn from advice. Ronnie, on the other hand, was a bit more of a raging bull who charged headfirst and 
usually won by overpowering his opponent. One personality trait they did share, however, was that neither brother responded well to authority, as was exemplified in 1952 when they were called up for national service in the British Army. Back then, all young, healthy males between 17 and 21 years of age were required to serve two years in the armed forces. In the case of Ronnie and Reggie, they were assigned to an infantry regiment called the Royal Fusiliers at the Tower of London, but immediately got into trouble when they arrived there. They got into an argument with one of the training sergeants. They beat him up and left the barracks to go back home. The twins were arrested the following day and sent to military prison. In fact, most of their their time doing national service was spent either in a military prison or going on the run. They often got into fights, left their barracks without permission, and unsurprisingly, they both got court-martialed and received dishonorable discharges, after which they were transferred to a civilian prison to serve some time for several offenses that they committed off base. The court marshals pretty much sunk both of their boxing careers, so after they got out, the craze needed to find something new to do. They started out small. They got a loan from their older brother and leased a pool hall in Bethnal Green. During their time spent in jail, Ronnie and Reggie had already befriended plenty of other shady characters, and the pool hall soon turned into a regular haunt for many of their army buddies and other local hoodlums. The twins and their entourage would often gather at the club, then go out at night to the pubs, where two things were always guaranteed to happen, drinking and brawling. As a means of making money, the twins took advantage of the fact that their billiard hall wasn't yet on the police's radar, so they allowed a few local fences to store their stolen goods there and even conduct business with a cut of the profits going to the craze of course. Inevitably, this got them unwanted attention from some of the other neighborhood gangsters who did not appreciate the twins doing business on their turf. Specifically, the craze received a message from three brothers, all dock workers who invited the twins to stop by their pub on a Sunday morning for a drink and to talk. Of course, Ronnie and Reggie understood that this was a trap, but they went anyway. As soon as they entered, the door was locked and the pub landlord made himself scarce as the three dockers lunged at the twins to teach them a lesson. But it didn't go as they planned. When the landlord returned, he found two of the dock workers unconscious, while the third one was still being pummeled senseless by Ronnie Cray. Although young, the Crays made it pretty evident that they were legitimate tough guys who could not be intimidated, and their gang grew pretty quickly. By the time they turned 21 years old, the Crays had their fingers in a lot of pies, including extortion and theft, gambling, robbery, and cons. This was all still local, though, and the Crays were ready to move up in the world. In 1956, they became embroiled in a gang war as the two top kingpins of the East End, Billy Hill and Jack Spot Comer, fought for power. Comer used the Crays for muscle, but ultimately, they were on the losing side. One night, Comer and his wife were attacked by Hill's enforcer, Mad Frankie Frazier, and his men. He had his face slashed very badly, and eventually, Comer decided to call it quits while he was still alive. Despite coming up on top, Billy Hill didn't remain involved in the underworld of London's East End for long. The departures of him and Coma created a power void, and several new gangs rose up to fill it. Unsurprisingly, one of them belonged to the Crays, who called their burgeoning crime outfit The Firm. Ronnie and Reggie were, of course, at the head of the table. Their older brother, Charlie Cray, was also a member, although he later claims not to have been involved in the violent stuff and mainly to have acted as the legitimate frontman for many of their operations. A cousin named Ronnie Hart was also part of The Firm, as were dozens of other men. We're not going to name them all, but just a few other key members were John Dixon, Albert Donahue, Ian Barry, and Connie Whitehead. In just a few years, the firm emerged as one of London's most dangerous gangs, as the craze controlled a large area of the East End where every business, be it legitimate or illegal, paid its dues to the twins. Of course, with this ascendancy within London's criminal underworld also came more attention from the police. The craze first got into hot water in late 1956, when Ronnie shot someone for the first time. The target was a man who threatened to beat up a car dealer under the protection of the firm. Ronnie got into a fight with him, and during the struggle, shot the guy once in the leg. The man later went to the police, but the craze got off using a bit of twin trickery. The authorities picked up one of the craze, they formally charged him, and the victim ID'd him. Only after this was done did the accused reveal himself to be Reggie Craig not Ronnie, and presented an airtight alibi for the time of the shooting. Embarrassed, the police had no choice but to release him, and the whole matter was dropped after the victim received some unofficial compensation from the firm for his suffering. Now, not all altercations went this smoothly. Later that same year, the Crays became partners in a West End club called The Stragglers, located in Soho. It was the first of many such ventures, but in this particular case, the role of the Crays was to keep out the troublemakers looking to start fights so that the club could begin attracting a higher class of clientele. Unsurprisingly, this led to conflict. Bobby Ramsey, the guy who brought in the Crays on the deal, got on the wrong side of a gang called the Watney Streeters, who ambushed him one night and gave him a serious beating. The Crays had no choice but to respond to this attack, so a few weeks later, the firm raided a pub called the Britannia, which 
which was a hangout of the Watneys. However, the latter got wind of the attack, so everybody managed to escape out of the back door, except for a guy called Terry Martin, who was stabbed and beaten to within an inch of his life. Later that night, as cars with firm members prowled the East End looking for more Watneys, one of them was stopped by a police patrol. It contained Ramsey and Ronnie Cray, who were both arrested for the assault of Terry Martin. Reggie was also brought in, but he was later released. Ronnie, on the other hand, got three years in jail. In November 1956, he went to Wandsworth Prison, leaving Reggie Cray as the sole boss of the firm. At first, Ronnie took to prison life reasonably well, thanks to his connections and entourage that provided him with all the comforts that one could find on the inside. However, things got worse after he was transferred away from London. He was showing signs of paranoia, which only got worse after he heard that his aunt Rose had passed away. Nowadays, he would have been deemed a paranoid schizophrenic with homicidal tendencies, but in the 1950s, he was simply diagnosed with prison psychosis and certified insane. On the outside, Reggie Cray was doing significantly better. Although he was a very violent man, he was more cool and collected than his brother was, and he was more interested in becoming a successful businessman than a tough gangster. Reggie also thought it was time to move out of the old pool hall into new headquarters, so he opened the Double R Club on Bow Road. It became quite a trendy London hangout, and gave the Crays their first taste of mingling with the stars. Charlie Cray, who was brought in to handle the day-to-day -day running of the club, even had a six-month fling with an actress and future dame Barbara Windsor, most famous for her roles in the Carry On films. In 1959, Ronnie Cray was released from prison. The following year, the Betting and Gaming Act of 1960 was passed, which legalized additional forms of gambling in the UK. The Crays were among the first to take advantage of this new law when they opened a gambling club called Esmeralda's Barn. It became a giant goldmine for the twins, but trouble struck again as this time Reggie was given an 18-month prison sentence for attempted extortion. Finally, in 1961, both Crays were out and free of legal troubles. The firm was established as one of London's biggest and baddest criminal outfits, collecting tributes each month from a long list of businesses that extended beyond the East End. Furthermore, the Crays' developing reputation as successful club owners meant that they kept receiving new offers from other clubs wanting to take them on as partners. Business was booming. The Crays were making a lot of money while living out their fantasy lifestyles and rubbing elbows with the rich and powerful. Strangely enough, when the twins did find themselves in Broiled in scandal, it had nothing to do with their criminal empire, but rather for their sexual exploits. For most of his life, Ronnie Cray was openly gay and had a lot of relationships with young men who worked in his nightclubs and gambling halls. Later on, he married two women while incarcerated, Elaine Mildener and Kate Howard, but he divorced them both after a few years. Reggie preferred to keep it more private. He was also married twice, and to the world at large, he maintained that he was straight. Although rumors that he was bisexual had always persisted, it was mainly after Reggie's death that some of the people close to him mentioned that he had had several relationships with men. The reason this became relevant was because in 1964, a British tabloid ran a story about a prominent politician and member of the House of Lords who was having an affair with a notorious gangster. They even had a photograph of the two together, but due to British libel laws, they could not publish it or even mention the name of the politician. The foreign press, however, had no such concern for these laws, so a German publication named them both Ronnie Cray and Lord Boothby. Obviously, the Member of Parliament denied this allegation, claiming that he only met Ronnie Cray for a business meeting. He sued the tabloid and won a large settlement plus a public apology, which discussed encouraged other newspapers from covering the story. However, decades later, declassified files showed that the Home Office took the matter very seriously and had Boothby secretly investigated by MI5. The report described Lord Boothby as a kinky fellow, but mentioned that the tabloids got the story wrong. He and Ronnie Cray were not having an affair, but they did attend a few gay parties together, as they both preferred younger men. Ultimately, MI5 concluded that the matter was of no national concern, so the Boothby affair was largely forgotten. Once again, the Crays were back to business as usual, but it would not be until long after after that business was disrupted permanently. The firm seemed pretty protected from the law, but the same could not be said when it came to other gangs. There were still plenty of dangerous criminals in London's underworld who had no love for the Cray twins, and chief among them was the Richardson gang. They were rivals of the firm throughout the 1960s and often butted heads over the same rackets. They were quite vicious with a reputation for torture and included members such as the leaders Charles and Eddie Richardson, the aforementioned mad Frankie Frazier, and a giant bull of a man with a mean streak named George Cornell, a former member of the Watney Street gang. The the conflict between the two groups reached its peak on March 8, 1966, when a large-scale fight between the two sides erupted at a club named Mr. Smith's. The three men were seriously injured during a brawl, and an associate of the craze named Dickie Hart was 
shot and killed. Roddy and Reggie were not present during the fight, and neither was Cornell on the side of the Richardsons. Two days later, however, George Cornell went to the hospital to visit one of the gang members who got injured in the fight. After he left, he stopped for a drink at a pub in Whitechapel called The Blind Beggar. Unbeknownst to him, the Craze and a few other members of the firm were drinking in another pub just a few hundred yards away. Somebody called to inform them of Cornell's whereabouts, at which point Ronnie Cray got into a car with John Dixon and Ian Barry and drove to The Blind Beggar. As soon as they entered the pub, George Cornell turned around and said something along the lines of, well, just look who's here. Those were his last words as Ronnie Cray walked up to him, pulled out a 9mm pistol, and shot him in the head. Barry shot a few times in the ceiling for intimidation, and the couple calmly walked out of the blind beggar and drove away. Despite the obvious nature of the crime, Ronnie was safe from the law for the time being. The police were finding it hard to build a case against him as nobody wanted to testify. Either that, or they were waiting for the right moment when they would be able to send both twins to prison at once. They didn't have to wait too long. Although Reggie was usually the more level-headed sibling, in 1967 he too fell into a deep depression with violent mood swings after his wife, Frances Shear, died of an apparent suicide. This led him to committing his first and, as far as we know, only murder, something which he did at the insistence of his brother, who up until that point had been annoyed by the fact that Reggie never took that fatal final step. The target was a criminal named Jack the Hat McVitie. He wasn't a member of the firm, but he was an associate used for the occasional job. At the time, he was on bad terms with the twins, chiefly for bungling a hit he was supposed to carry out and then refusing to pay back the advance he was given. On the night of October the 28th, 1967, most of the firm was drinking at a pub called The Carpenter's Arms when word came in that McVitie was on his way. The craze cleared the place of other guests and got into an argument with him as soon as he walked through the door. Reggie pulled out a gun and squeezed the trigger but it jammed. He then pounced on McVitie, and with his brother screaming next to him, he began to stab him in the face, neck, and chest. Once the deed was done, some of the other firm members disposed of the body, which has never been recovered. The death of Jackie McVitie proved to be the beginning of the end for the Cray twins. For starters, it caused a lot of tension within the firm, as members felt like what had happened to McVitie could also happen to them. Furthermore, unbeknownst to the Crays, Scotland Yard had been collecting evidence and testimonies against them since 1964 under the command of Leonard Nipper Reed. In May 1968, the police decided that it was now or never and arrested almost 20 members of the firm, hoping that the evidence they had gathered would be enough to convince some of them to take deals. Fortunately, the Crays did a lot of the hard work for them because their master plan to avoid jail time for any murder murders was simply to have other members of the firm take the blame on their behalf. Shockingly, this wasn't well received, and some of those gang members gave evidence against the craze. Of particular importance was the testimony of a former business partner of the firm named Leslie Payne. He was the one that Jack the Hat failed to kill, so naturally, since the craze had put a hit out on him, he didn't feel particularly loyal towards them. Lastly, the barmaid of the blind beggar accepted police protection and identified Ronnie Cray as the man who killed George Cornell. In 1969, Ronnie and Reggie Cray were each found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years served. This was, at the time, the longest sentence for murder given out at the Old Bailey. Eight other gangsters were found guilty of murder or being accessories to murder, bringing an end to the firm. For a few years, the brothers were together in the maximum security wing of Parkhurst Prison. However, with Ronnie's schizophrenia getting worse, he was transferred to Broadmoor Mental Hospital, where he spent the rest of his life until his death in 1995 at the age of 61. Reggie Cray was released from prison on compassionate grounds in September 2000 due to terminal cancer, and he spent the last few weeks at home before dying the following month, age 66. The Cray's grasp on the criminal London underworld might have ended over 50 years ago, but their notoriety and unique place in pop culture is still going strong. So I really hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe once again. Thanks to Magic Spoon for sponsoring. There's a link to them below. And thank you for watching.